Okay. So we're reading from Nectar of Instruction. And this morning we'll be discussing text number six. Okay. So we're going to about uh, 22. Okay, so I'll read this, the verse, and then we'll read the translation, and then discuss on the basis. Okay. If everyone could settle, please. Jusue swabhava janite vapusas chatoshe na pra... Oh, do you actually have it? Oh, okay, sorry. Okay. So, yes, so if you repeat the first line. Oh, okay, I'll say it again, and then you could repeat it. Jusue swabhava janite vapusas chatoshe Na prakritat vam iha bhakta janasya pasyet. Gangam basham na kalubud buddha vena panke. Brahma dravat vam apagachati nirodame. So please repeat after me. This day, seen by ordinary vision. Swabhava janite, born of one's own nature. Vapusaha, of the body. Cha, and. Dose, by the faults. Na, not. Prakritatvam, the state of being material. Iha, in this world. Bhakta Janasya, of a pure devotee. Pasyet, one should see. Ganga Ambasam, of the Ganges water. Na, not. Kalo, certainly. Buddha Buddha Fena Parike, sorry, Panke, by bubbles, foam, and mud. <coughs> Brahma Ravatvam, the transcendental nature. Apagachati is spoiled. Niradame, the characteristics of water. Translation by Zivan Grace AC Bhaktivedanta Swami Shula Prabhupada Shula Prabhupada Ki Jai Being situated in his original Krishna conscious position, a pure devotee does not identify with the body. Such a devotee should not be seen from a materialistic point of view. Indeed, one should overlook a devotee's having a, a body born in a low family, a body with a bad complexion, a deformed body, or a diseased or infirm body. According to ordinary vision, such imperfections may seem prominent in the body of a pure devotee. But despite such seeming defects, the body of a pure devotee cannot be polluted. It is exactly like the waters of the Ganges, which sometimes during the rainy seasons are full of bubbles, foam and mud. The Ganges water does, um, do not become polluted. Those who are advanced in spiritual understanding will bathe in the Ganges without considering the condition of the water. Yeah. So we'll just say Mangala Charin and then we'll begin our discussion. Please join in. Nomakiyana Timurandasya Kinanjana Shalakaya Chakshum Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Guruvena Maha Shri Chaitanya Manobishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadanti Kam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Yuta Padakamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raganatam Vitam Tvam Sijivam Sadvaitam Savadutam Purjana Saitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakam Vitamscha 
Hey Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopisha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanchana Gorangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Vishabhanu Sutta Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vansha Kalpa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhyayavacha Patitanam Pavani Bhyo Vaishnavi Bhyo Namo Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadara Shri Vasudhi Gaurabhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So this verse is speaking about vision. It is particularly speaking about how we perceive the pure devotee. It indicates how we perceive devotees in general, the principle of devotee perception. It gives us a firm understanding of the importance of seeing through the eyes of higher knowledge. And in the purple also, it will also speak about the way that we even perceive um, the faults of, a, of someone who's trying to practice devotional service. So again, Sri Rupa Goswami, being such an empowered and connected devotee, is giving us essential teachings. And I was discussing with someone recently how powerful it is when devotees coming to our movement are taught how to see. Hmm? We often find so many challenges because we come in with a certain material perception. And earlier this year, and um, we were speaking about the fall down of um, Bharat Maharaj. So Bharat Maharaj this very, very great personality, he was a great king. He even managed, he gave up his entire kingdom, right? Kingdom, not just a few possessions. He gave up his entire kingdom, wife, family, everything to engage in devotional service. And then, having given all that up, what does he become attached to? A deer. Mm -hmm. You can give up palaces, riches, wealth, fame, power, influence, and then become attached to a deer. So, it is considered, people may wonder, you know, what, what is going on? How did this happen? In the Bhakti Sandarbha, it is explained that the fact that Bharat Maharaj fell down based upon the attachment to a deer, when he was practicing devotional service from the platform of Bhava Bhakti, Right? which is devotional service in ecstasy. Right? Spiritual emotions are being experienced at that stage. Right? And it is one, both prema and bhakti are considered devotional service in perfection. They're perfected stages. Right? So he fell down from there. So in the Bhakti Sandarbha, it's explained that one's past karma cannot pull one down from the platform of devotional service at Bhava Bhakti. Hmm? So in the, in the Bhagavatam, it's the term that's used is it says karma, right, in the translation. But it's explained by the Goswamis that because one's previous karma cannot pull one down from the platform of Bhava Bhakti, one has to take an, a secondary meaning of that term karma. And so in the Bhakti Sandarpa, it is said that he must have committed an offense to a devotee in the previous life. Hmm? Think about that. Huh? That means that something done previously in a previous life followed someone into the next life and eventually pulled them down. Huh? And our dealings with people is based upon how we see them. Here, it is being said in a very <coughs> straightforward way that one should not consider a pure devotee to be his body. Right? 
That's, so it's just being, it's given the point that this is not how you should see a pure devotee. But actually there are other statements in the Shastra which, go, which, which are much more cutting and saying that to see a devotee as their body is an offense. Hmm? Like that. Huh? And it's, I think it's in 11, 4, 12 Canto Bhagavad says to see in such a way one has a mentality that resides in hell. Hmm? To have that kind of vision. Very, very interesting. A very, very powerful thing. And Prabhupada will also, in this purport, <laughs> very interesting, he's addressing, some of, he's addressing the situation regarding some of his godbrothers. He actually directly states that. Who, in some exchanges, rela relating more to his followers, would kind of categorize them on the basis of the body. Mm -hmm. And we'll maybe read that as well to you. But let's begin with this underlying point. Ladies and gentlemen, please remember that we've come into the material world. We've come in to the material world and then from there we're trying to engage in Krishna consciousness. Our greatest enemies are our hidden misconceptions. Hmm? Misconceptions are powerful because we don't even question them. They're there, they're so close to us, it's taken for granted. How many times misunderstandings have happened in the community of Vaishnavas because people have not clarified their expectations. They're not clear. What the Shastra does is it tells you what you should expect, how you should see, how you should deal. There is a culture that comes with this philosophy. There is an etiquette. Hmm? And if we avoid trying to understand and live by these principles, of respectful dealings and perceiving in a higher way, then we will miss out on the sweetness, the adventure and the wonderful blessings that is always being offered by the Parampara. Hmm? So this is how to see and practically the entire teachings of Krishna consciousness is how to see and how to behave. Huh? We want to see and behave in the way that will please the spiritual master, in the way that will please Krishna. And we know how to please Krishna by those who are intimately connected to Krishna. Mm -hmm. So they will explain to us how to see. Okay, so, so this statement, such a devotee should not be seen from a materialistic point of view. Huh? Bhava Grahi, no, not that verse. Atmavan Manyate Jagat. Prabhupada says everyone sees the world from their own perspective. Isn't that interesting? Everyone sees the world from their own perspective. This is very dangerous. Very dangerous. Because then the same activity can be read in a whole range of different ways. Hmm? And that happens again and again and again. Where there is sufficient humility and understanding, then what we do is we learn to approach the situation with an open understanding, with an open inquiry to try and understand. We try and learn what is proper, what was understood, why people did what they did, and then we move forward from there into a more deep and rich spiritual life. Huh? Much of our suffering can be removed just by understanding this one point. So why are we expressing this point? Let's look at this. So first of all, Prabhupada will make the point. He says here, Shuddha Bhakti, the activity of the soul proper, in other words, engagement in the transcendental loving of the soul of the Lord, loving service of the Lord, sorry, is performed in a liberated condition. Hmm? That means it is performed on a platform above the material mind and senses. Huh? The pure devotee is not their body. And funnily enough, no one is their body. In this material world, no one is their body. What is the material body? The material body is a manifestation of a previous mentality. Hmm? You understand? The material body is a manifestation of a previous mentality. I have a friend in London. He had his, um, someone did some kind of reading. And they told him that in his previous life, <laughs> he was a female. Right? 
and he had an Iranian lover, right? An Iranian partner. Iranian. Partner, yeah, Iranian partner. Yeah, so what happened was he passed, um, she passed away thinking about that partner. So in this life, that woman, or that person in the female body, took birth in the male body. Hmm? Huh? Oh, do you want to share that? Oh, Soul Street, yeah, of course. Oh, you know about that much, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so there's, okay, so yes, we know one devotee, and um, she actually did some research, and then she found out about her previous life, and in her previous life, she was a Prabhupada disciple, if I remember correctly. Yeah, she was a Prabhupada disciple. Yeah. I don't remember all the details of it. Oh, in Scotland, yes. Yeah, she's actually a Brahmacharya in Scotland. And it makes sense, if you see her, you can see she's got a certain kind of, yeah, a certain kind of nature. It, it really does, it fits. So yes, yeah, so this point is, this body is a manifestation of a previous karma. In the Mahabharata, after the Battle of Kukshetra, Dhritarashtra asks a question. He says, why is it that I was born blind, and why is it that my 100 sons had to die? And the answer he's given, he was told that 50 lifetimes ago you were a hunter, and you shot a flaming arrow into a nest of birds. You killed the birds in the nest, and the flames from your arrow, the parent birds, they escaped, but the flames from the arrow burned their eyes, seared their eyes, so they were blinded. So Jitrarashtra replied, said, I understand that, but that was 50 lifetimes ago. So why is it that in this life, I was born blind and my 100 sons had to die? And he was told that that's because it took you 50 lifetimes to come to the point of having 100 sons. Hmm? It took you 50 lifetimes to come to the point of having 100 sons. Hmm? And the karma, yes. Yes, like that. So it's very, very interesting. Huh? But what we're doing in devotional service is not a bodily activity. In our devotional activities, we're trying to understand, or ultimately, by purification, come to the point where we realize our eternal identity. Hmm? We really want to understand that. This teaching and this movement is extremely special. There's a letter by Prabhupada. And in this letter, he says, <clears throat> actually, I do not um, recruit any disciples. He says, I only recruit so many masters and train them up in the engagement of devotional service. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. What well, Prabhupada seems to indicate, as Maharaj also said, many of the people who engage in devotional service in this lifetime, they were devotees in their previous life. Mm -hmm. We simply have these different bodies due to previous activities, previous mentalities, but we know we're not the body. Hmm? And this activity that we're performing, this devotional service, this takes place on the spiritual platform. Hmm? It is taking place on the spiritual platform. They, sometimes Prabhupada is glorified because he said he built a house the whole world can live in. Hmm? It's very, very interesting. Where else do you find such an international array of individuals? Hmm? In the modern world, this type of thing is unheard of. Because in the modern world, there's more and more gross identification with the body. So it's one group versus another. But you know what the irony is? Often, the groups who are against each other in their next life, they'll take the other position. Hmm? If you have hatred for a particular group, the best way to teach you that that's not appropriate is to put you in their position so you can see what it's like to be on the receiving end. Huh? It's very, very interesting. And these are just temporary garments because we've been in so many different types of body, uh, in so many different lifetimes. Practically speaking, the more that one identifies with the body, the more you are guaranteed to suffer. Hmm? So. Again, very practical. 
Whenever we find ourselves identifying with our body, remember that the more you identify now, the more intense any suffering that comes with the body will feel to you. Mm? So there is a situation that happens with the body, but your experience of it is based upon consciousness. Mm? So these teachings are very, very, very important for that reason. Very important. They told Prabhupada, one doctor told him, when they examined his body, he said, Prabhupada, there are so many things wrong with your body that you should be screaming in pain. Hmm? Prabhupada was never screaming in any pain. Because he was completely above the bodily identity. Hmm? The pure devotee is above the bodily identity. And the devotees, even the devotees who are practicing, they are simply using this body as a vehicle in this life engaged in devotional service. But they do not, they are not that particular body, they are not that particular form. Hmm? This body is inferior nature. <clears throat> a very, Bhumi Apunalavaya Kama Nabudi Evacha, Ahankarita Ami Bina Prakati Ashtada. This body is made up of the elements, gross physical and subtle material elements. But then Krishna says, Aperiyamitastwanyam prakutim vidi me prom jiva bhuta mahabaho yaya damdaya tejagat. Aperiyam, but superior above this, uh, is a living entity. And it is simply our misidentification with the body which means that we then suffer everything that relates to the body. Uh, these three kleshas uh, adi atmic, adi divic, adi baltic. Uh, the suffering from the mind and body the suffering from other living entities, and also the suffering from the natural um, situation, from the demigods, uh, the external conditions. All of these things are sufferings which relate to the body, and to the extent that someone identifies with that, it relates to you as well. Uh? So, every day we have a chance to prepare for death. Every day. Every day. And every day that we identify more with the body, every day we intensify our suffering. Hmm? It's completely unnecessary. Let's go on to some points. <clears throat> so, we mentioned this pure devotional service is performed on the... So there is a way of perceiving this community of Vaishnavas and individuals. Hmm? And I'm sure as the movement develops more and more, what you'll find is one day everyone who comes, when they first come, they'll be trained as to how to see. So they'll understand from day one, okay, leave your material misconceptions at the door. This is how you are to perceive the Vaishnavas. And when you perceive properly, you'll deal properly. When you deal properly, you'll make the most advancement. Hmm? Again, keys to spiritual acceleration. If I see the Vaishnavas properly, I will deal with them properly. If I deal with them properly, I won't even become frustrated by certain dealings because I understand how to perceive the Vaishnavas. In this purport, and this is one of the most important aspects, <coughs> Prabhupada quotes Bhagavad Gita, chapter 9, text number 30. A very, very famous and instructive verse. And actually, this verse is materially counterintuitive, right? This verse, it goes against our material perception. In the material world, someone does something wrong, you condemn them, right? Uh, they call it um, the attribution error. In the material world, they even they speak about this. The attribution error means that when you do something wrong, you think it's just circumstantial. Right? I'm a nice guy, really. You know, I hadn't had enough sleep. That's why I shouted at this person. Right? It's just circumstantial. But if anyone else does something wrong, it's characteristic of them, isn't it? It's just that's how they are. You know, I saw. You know, he's always shouting. He's always rude. He's always angry. You know? Think about it. Isn't that interesting? If I do anything wrong, it's just a, a an unusual twist of nature because normally I, I behave perfectly. But if anyone else does something wrong, that's how they are. It's their habit. It's the way that they were born. They will, they'll be like this forever. You know? It's very, very interesting. So this verse is quoted by Prabhupada and this is Bhagavad Gita. Abhichet Sudharacharo, 
Bajate, Mamananya Bak, Sadu Eva Samanta Vya, Samyak Vya Vasito, Hisaha. Even if a devotee sometimes seems to engage in abominable activities, he should be considered a sadhu, a saintly person, because his actual identity is that of one engaged in the loving service of the Lord. In other words, he is not to be considered an ordinary human being. So it's not my words. This is exactly what Prabhupada says. No one who's practicing devotional service should be considered to be an ordinary human being. <clears throat> hmm? Now it's very interesting. Let's look at this. Prabhupada says because his actual identity is that of one engaged in the loving service of the Lord. When you give your heart to this process of Krishna consciousness, when you give your heart to your guru, when you accept once, tr deeply, sincerely, that I am a servant of Krishna, your journey out of this material energy is guaranteed. Huh? It may take time to mature, to fully be realized on that platform. Huh? But actually, identity is so powerful because all activity is a symptom of identity. Hmm? You see, because his identity is that, is, one, is that of one engaged in the loving service of the Lord, Prabhupada says. Because one identifies themselves as a servant of the Lord, they serve. That's when they do service. However you see yourself, that will determine how you act. Hmm? So we can pray, dear Lord, please situate me fully in the understanding and in the full realization that I am not a servant. Not a servant. I am a servant of the servant of the servant of the Lord many, many times removed. Hmm? How powerful identity is. Hmm? Well, everything we're doing is a symptom of what we, how we really see ourselves. Huh? Who we really see ourselves to be. How, how we actually consider ourselves to be. And at the same time, there's another point related to this statement by Prabhupada. And that is that certain habits that we have are due to previous conditioning. So someone identifies themselves now as a devotee of the Lord, but they're not fully realizing their identity. In other words, all the symptoms of their behavior are not fully manifested from that identity because the previous habits are still winding down. <coughs> hmm? Previous habits do not die overnight, isn't it? Have you noticed that? That some of your previous habits didn't just die the moment you walked into the temple. Right? Okay. So, just like Prabhupada talks about how when one takes initiation, the fan, it's like you have the fan and you unplug it, but the fan takes time to wind down. In addition, a devotee's previous habits may take time before they fully disappear. Previous bad habits. So on that basis, they may act in a way which is not the standard or the proper way of behaving. But because they're situated in the identity as being a servant of the Lord, it, it will just be a question of time, a matter of time, and a matter of them staying in the association and in the practice of devotional service, that these previous habits will disappear. So it's very, very powerful to understand that. What you're dealing with when you look at any devotee, if they're not pure, you're dealing with some remnants of their previous conditioning. What they are, you're dealing with what they identify themselves as with now. And wonderfully, wonderfully, is you're seeing like a flower. You're seeing a flower that is blossoming by taking the sustenance, the sun, the rays of the Krishna sun. Huh? So these personalities who come to Krishna consciousness, if they practice this devotional service properly, if they stay in the fertile soil of devotional service and receive the blessings of the son of Krishna's mercy, they will simply blossom. Hmm? The funny thing and the interesting thing is you are also part of the conditions in which other people develop. Huh? For example, even if there's one person in a community who's very pure in their service, 
that service will release so much blessings in the atmosphere that it will actually it will nourish so many others in that in the environment. Hmm? It, let's say the person who's just cleaning the, 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 the floor in the temple room is cleaning with great devotion. So much blessings will come to that individual and the entire community because of the purity of their service. And everyone else will be blessed by that purity. So we are also creating the atmosphere in which other people are either flourishing or we're creating an atmosphere which is in some ways, holding people back from their devotion. Hmm? I won't mention where, but there was one Prabhupada disciple, a you know, very practiced devotee. He came to one temple in one country. He came before the deities, and he actually said, this place is a graveyard. And he turned around and he left. Hmm? Because in that community, there was so much conflict, Sadhu, um, you know, Vaishnav Aparad, faithlessness. Yeah, he said, this place is a graveyard. He just turned around and he walked out. Hmm? We don't want that situation to happen. Hmm? We want to create an environment that everyone flourishes and everyone grows. Hmm? And we do that by recognizing and encouraging the best in others. It's, it's a real science. Real spiritual relationship, real deep devotion is not to condemn or see people even where they are right now. It's to see and bring about or to cultivate their devotion. Prabhupada did that expertly. Maj was speaking about that yesterday. Someone isn't difficult, how do you help? Hmm? Think about it. Who do you see who has that attitude? I'll tell you who has that attitude. Krishna has that attitude. Hmm? We've left Krishna, we've come to this material world. Huh? There is what is called uh, the primordial envy. When even at an advanced stage, someone comes to the point where they actually start to realize and they see that actually there's a strong hatred for Krishna. Why does he have to be? Why is he the center? Why can't I be the center? And one has to even move beyond that platform. Huh? So, what does Krishna do, knowing that this world is full of living entities who are envious of him? Does he just condemn? No. He makes arrangements. He mercifully sends, as Marge said yesterday, he sends his pure representatives to reclaim those personalities. Hmm? He sends people to reclaim those personalities. He doesn't just see their envious end of story. He considers how to convert or how to bring these people back to their senses. So we want to have that mood. Huh? We want to forgive others even if they make mistakes. We want to compassionately help others. Why? Because we also want to be forgiven, isn't it? There's a science to relationship. Hmm? Someone once said, relationship means two things. Give and forgive. Hmm? Give and forgive. Hmm? We want to be forgiven for our mistakes, so we also want to forgive others for theirs. Otherwise, what we're saying is, Krishna, please be merciful unto me, but not these other people, because they really did something I didn't like. You should really punish them, right? But if I do anything wrong, then you know, just, um, you know, I'm, you know I'm a good person, really. Just, just overlook it. Huh? So it's, it's hypocrisy. It's hypocrisy. If you, Krishna says, Yeyetaman Prapadyanti, he will reciprocate. Hmm? So we should deal very, very wisely with others. And this is a vision that's given in the Shastra. Huh? It is better to try to convert the Maya than to just condemn. <clears throat> hmm? We're not to be blind followers. We're spiritual scientists. But where we see something wrong, we, as Marge said very clearly, we recognize we... We dislike the sin, but we still love the sinner. The person is different from their anatta, or their mistakes, or their bad habits. Does that make sense? So in the next life, if they're really fortunate, they'll, they'll be able to take birth in the West and join the Hare Krishna movement. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Yeah, they'll take birth in the West and join our movement, if you're very lucky. If you perform your deity worship, very, very nice. 
It's a very, very wonderful thing. Very wonderful. Do you want to make a comment? Another one. You know, one devotee, one lady said, uh, she was a devotee, she was a You'll be born in a Brahmin family. Uh -huh. <laughs> I bless you that you'll be born in a Brahmin family next life. And Prabhupada said, "Yes, yeah, just like a crow blesses a cow." Ooh, <laughs> wow! <laughs> heavy, that's heavy. Yeah, so it's very, very powerful. It's very, very powerful. To Mal Krishna Maharaj asked Prabhupada, "How many pure devotees are there on the planet?" Prabhupada said to him, "How many devotees are there in this ISKCON movement?" He said, as many devotees as there are in this ISKCON movement, there are at least that many pure devotees on the planet. Papa said that. Hmm? It may not be that everyone was pure in the sense of being a pure, unalloyed devotee of Noah Natas, you know, Prema Bhakta, but pure in the sense of their motive, their desire. So someone can be pure from the point of view of motive. <coughs> Rupa Goswami says that the four types of people who come to Krishna consciousness, as mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita, he says that those four, he said the Kanishta Adhikari is above those four, can be above those four. He said the Kanishta Adhikari can be a pure devotee if he's pure in motive. Right? But the, poor, the four types of people who come to Krishna, as mentioned in Bhagavad Gita, Shatavida, Bhajante Mam, Jnana Sukritina, Arjun. Those four, for them, it's slightly different. For those four, they're coming to Krishna, but they're coming because they want something. So someone is distressed, or someone is inquisitive, right? or someone is after material wealth, or someone is coming out of knowledge. right? So for these four people, the Kanisha Adhikar said that he can be above those four. Why? Because for these four people, Krishna is not the goal. Krishna is the means. So they're distressed, but they come into Krishna because by using Him or by engaging in something connected to Him, they'll get their distress taken away. Someone else is inquisitive, they come into Krishna so He can satisfy their curiosity, etc., etc., etc. So it's a, it's a slightly different thing. Very, very interesting. So these are points which give us a way of understanding how to see. How to perceive, because actually, how you feel about someone is based upon how you see them. Hmm? So people sometimes have always get into conflicts and they'll say, but I can't help the way I feel. No, you can. You can. If you see through the eyes of Shastra, you will take a situation and a circumstance in a different way. And because you'll, you'll see it in a different way, you'll feel differently about it. And you'll make advancement if it's done properly, if your interactions are done properly. Hmm? Very, very, very powerful principle. Here, Prabhupada goes on to say, <coughs> so yeah, even though a devotee, even though a pure devotee may not be born in the Brahmana or Goswami family, if he is engaged in the service of the Lord, he should not be neglected. In actuality, there cannot be a family of Goswamis based on material considerations, caste, or heredity. The Goswami title is actually the monopoly of the pure devotees. Hmm? Isn't that interesting? It is a question of consciousness. It is a question of devotion, ultimately. Hmm? Why? Because, think about it. Do you think Krishna is going to neglect anyone who sincerely wants to serve him? Hmm? Can you imagine Krishna saying, no, you were born in this place, therefore... I'm not going to accept your, your, your service. Huh? No. It's not like that at all. The wonder of this movement <coughs> is also, as Prabhupada says, he made a point to some devotees, some of his disciples, that you took birth in different places, just help me to spread my movement. Isn't that amazing? You took birth in different places just to help me to spread this movement. Amazing. So this is, this is something very amazing that's going on. So one Prabhupada disciple, when he was first looking into spiritual life, he was practicing different types of yoga systems and so on, and he had a teacher. And this teacher would teach him different things, but he would say to him, that actually, I'm not your guru. 
you know, but he would teach him different things. And he would explain, he would say that, you know, you know, the scripture, you know, we've understood things previously like this, but Prabhupada has written that actually it's like that. So now we should understand it in this particular way. Right? Yeah, it, would like, it would be like that. And then eventually this particular person took initiation from another teacher, another spirit, so-called spiritual teacher. And he went back to his previous teacher and he said, I found the Jagat Guru. Right? And he told his teacher who he'd taken initiation from. He said, this person, he's not the Jagat Guru. He said, this person, he's just some impersonalist. Right? And his teacher said to him, do you want to know who the real Jagat Guru is? And so the student said, um, yeah. but he was a bit scared actually. Because then the teacher asked him again, do you really want to know who the real Jagat Guru's, Guru is? Who the real Guru of the universe is? So this student eventually, he kind of decided, actually, I do want to know. And so his teacher told him that the Jagat Guru, the Guru of the entire universe, is Srila Prabhupada, the founder of the Hare Krishna movement. And when the student heard it, he was shocked. He said, what? He said, you mean these people? These people, he said, he'd seen them. He said, I'd seen these people out in the cold, jumping up and down, singing and dancing. He said, I, I, I didn't think that these people would have any higher philosophy. Hmm? But he was told by his teacher, he said that the person who is the leader of this movement, he is the guru of the universe. He said that this movement, these people have the higher knowledge on the planet, have the highest knowledge on the planet. So this student started to look into or read the books of Prabhupada to try and understand something about the movement. And then eventually he came back and saw his old teacher and he wanted to ask his old teacher some questions. And his old teacher became furious. He said, you've met Srila Prabhupada, you've met the, the guru of the universe, and now you're coming back to me, asking me questions about spirituality, about Krishna consciousness. He said, when Prabhupada came on the planet, there were other teachers, spiritual teachers, who knew of his caliber. He said, such people, when Prabhupada came on the planet, they should have stopped teaching, and they should have directed everyone to Srila Prabhupada. He said, you will not make me such an offender. He said, now you get out of here and you never come back. <laughs> hmm? Interesting. So often we don't recognize what we have. Huh? So Prabhupada and those connected with Prabhupada, they're very special. The personalities who join this movement are very special. And Maya infiltrates when we bring in a mundane consciousness, a mundane way of seeing people, a mundane way of dealing with people, which just hurts our, our devotional progress. Hmm? It's like being in the spiritual world, but if you have a mundane consciousness, you're not there. Huh? Think about it. I remember hearing one pastime how Prabhupada was in, with the devotees, and he kept looking into the corner and laughing. <clears throat> and later on the devotees asked Prabhupada, Prabhupada, what was going on? He said Narada Muni had come into the environment. <laughs> and he said we were laughing about how all these Malachas and Yamanas have become devotees. <laughs> yeah, this is funny. He's saying like that. <clears throat> so the devotees are very, very special. <laughs> They're so special. And they have a wish-fulfilling potency. Uh, with proper dealings, everything comes. Everything comes. Okay, so. And this can also relate to how people see even the Guru. So, Jade Waita Maharaj mentioned two, uh, it's two really wonderful pastimes. So he mentioned how um, one situation happened with one devotee called Hansa Dutta. When Hansa Dutta first came to the movement, when he, well, when he first started to meet devotees and come to the temple, and he was looking, he was, you know, this idea of, you know, they have the spiritual teacher, and the spiritual teacher is perfect, because this verse is talking about the bodily, so-called bodily defects, and one should not see in this way. So when he saw Prabhupada, and Prabhupada was about to give class, and he saw Prabhupada put the glasses on, right, to read, he actually thought, this is nonsense, you know? And he actually thought, he's supposed to be posing as a Swami. He's supposed to be perfect. Why does he need glasses? Right? Glasses are material. Yeah, and he walked out. 
Yeah, obviously he came back again, and you know, he's he's understanding deep, and but that's he actually walked out when he first saw that. He thought, ah, it's material. You know, he's supposed to be a swami, he's supposed to be perfect, but he wears glasses. How is this? You know, it's just a misunderstanding. On another occasion, is this was in April 1975 in Mayapur. Jade Maharaj was speaking to Prabhupada. He said, Prabhupada, sometimes we see that um, the something about the Guru or the Acharya seems to be a mistake in some way, you know, like that. And Prabhupada says, only when you have a material viewpoint, right? But then Jai Vaitamaj continued. He said, for example, Prabhupada, sometimes we see that the spiritual master will misquote a verse, you know, like that, yeah? Or forget a verse, yes, exactly. He said, how, how are we to understand this, you know, like that? And Prabhupada says, the perfection of the spiritual master, the perfection of the acharya, and you can say the perfection of the devotee is how he is preaching and how he's practicing devotional service. That is the quality. That is the thing to look for. Hmm? That is actually how he's perfect. Yeah? These things are not the are not the thing to look for. Yeah? And so that's actually how Prabhupada answered. After J. Dwayne Maharaj asked Prabhupada that, his godbrothers really, yeah, they, they really told him off. You know, how could you ask Prabhupada this? How could you speak to them? like that? So then later on, he approached Prabhupada and he said, Prabhupada, I'm really sorry, was my question offensive? Prabhupada's reply was, not offensive, just ignorant. <laughs> <laughs> so we want to be free of ignorance. We want to have the right vision in that sense. Huh? So we want to see the devotee based upon his devotion or her devotion, not the external appearance. Huh? The devotee is not the body. But, and this is the key thing, unless we ourselves are devotees, it's hard to see devotees properly. Hmm? Very, very important point. And this also relates to what Maharaj was speaking about yesterday. The Madhyam, because of the knowledge, they discriminate properly and they deal properly. Hmm? And as we are meant to at least come to the Majin platform, then things will, will run really well. So we cannot neglect Vaishnava etiquette and proper understanding in our dealings with devotees. And where you don't know, one should ask. Yeah. Where we're not sure how to deal with someone, we should simply ask those who are more experienced and realized in how to deal properly. Guru, senior advanced devotees. Then we will always be protected because we will know how, according to Guru Sadhu Shastra, we are to deal with the different situations and circumstances that Krishna brings before us. Let's see. So, one of the reasons why we don't consider the body is everyone's body is just like a, an arrangement of matter. We know that there are even different doshas. In this verse, Prabhupada translates this word, yeah, dose, by the faults. So even there's, a, you know, the system of health called Ayurveda, says there's different doshas or different types of body, like that. Dosha means fault. So people will act differently even just because of the different bodily constitution. Hmm? It's very, very simple. If you, knew, if you know the science of it, you can even tell someone's mentality just by the type of body that they have. But it's nothing to do with their devotion, because the body is a vehicle. The real thing is how someone is serving Krishna nicely, how someone is serving Krishna sincerely, mm? like that. There are some devotees, their nature or their bodily constitution is such that they can be very austere. Mm? They have more capacity for austerity, actually. You know? For some devotees, their bodily constitution is such that they are, they, it's easier for them to... Um, Let's see, to be actually, uh, you know, to be talkative, to speak a lot, you know, like that. For some devotees, their bodily constitution is such that they're actually able to have more endurance. It's just all bodily constitutional issues. It's not the actual nature of the soul. Hmm? It's just the conditioning of the body in this particular life. So Krishna doesn't care about that. He cares about how much we are surrendering to Him. And that's the key point. Mm. <clears throat> Yeah, so we made that point. Let's see if there's anything else that we want to share around this, because we're almost due to end. Okay.
This is an interesting point. Prabhupada writes in this area of the nature of instruction. He says, as soon as one becomes materially puffed up, he immediately falls down. Isn't that interesting? As soon as one becomes materially puffed up, he immediately falls down. I'll share some other points in, in this relation. He says, according to this formula, the Goswamis who are descendants of Sri Nityananda Prabhu and Sri Advaita Prabhu are certainly devotees. But devotees coming from other families should not be discriminated against. Indeed, whether the devotees come from a family of previous acharyas or from an ordinary family, they should be treated equally. One should not think, oh, here is an American Goswami and discriminate against him. Nor should one think, here is a Nityananda Vamsa Goswami. There is an undercurrent of protest against our awarding the title Goswami to the American Vaishnavas of the Krishna Consciousness Movement. Sometimes people flatly tell the American devotees that their sannyas or title of Goswami is not bona fide. Uh, however, according to the statements of Sri Rupa Goswami in this verse, an American Goswami and a Goswami in the family of, Achar of Acharyas are non-different. Hmm? Yeah. And he goes on to say, one should not be artificially puffed up by thinking that he has become a Goswami. He should always remember that as soon as he becomes materially puffed up, he immediately falls down. Very strong statements by Prabhupada, you know. He goes on to say that there's no room for jealousy in the Krishna consciousness movement. And he says, movement's meant for the Paramahamsas, those who are free of jealousy. And then he says, let's see. We experience such difficulty in propagating this Krishna consciousness movement all over the world. Unfortunately, we are surrounded by neophyte godbrothers who do not appreciate the extraordinary activities of spreading Krishna consciousness all over the world. They simply try to bring us to their platform and they try to criticize us in every respect. We very much regret their naive activities and poor fund of knowledge. Very heavy statement. Prabhupada, I mean, you know, sometimes he could really just cut. But he did it out of compassion to protect the devotees, to protect the movement, and also to establish the proper standard. Because we should remember that these books are the law books for the next 10,000 years. Mm -hmm. So they're establishing that actually the bodily identification is not the devotee. Practically speaking, you'll find that everyone has taken birth in so many different races, genders, even different species. And this, this time, this is a time where we're meant to let go of that identification with the body. Hmm? In the uh, Chaitanya Shikshamrita, it mentions there are different duties for different types of bodies. That's there. But that's not the point. The point we're making here is that that's something that takes place more on the platform of um, social duty, but you know that you're not this body actually. You know that other people are not their body actually. We may deal differently with men and women because there is an etiquette that is part of the Vaishnava culture, but who are we? Jivaras Rupoy Krishna Nitya Das. Our body is a source of suffering ultimately because our body is going to die. A wise individual works to get off the bodily platform, especially when things are relatively peaceful. Before you come to the point of death and you're forced, but through a much more intense experience. Uh -huh. We can't take our body with us. We wouldn't want to take our body with us, really. Mm -hmm. But we do take our consciousness, our spiritual advancement. Mm -hmm. So every day, we want to understand that actually every day could be my last day on the planet and if I actually work on developing my Krishna consciousness, in fact by practicing Krishna consciousness properly we are actually helping to unfold our spiritual body. Mm -hmm. We're helping to actually unfold our spiritual body ultimately and that is our real identity as servants of Krishna. Huh? So it's a very wonderful and esoteric science, again practical, it's very practical. The intensity of the suffering with the body 
takes place to the degree that one identifies with the body. And the freedom from that comes by the sincere engagement in devotional service. Because devotional service means that you identify yourself as a servant of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And if we do this more and more now, then we're prepared for whatever time death comes. And if we do this now, we will be victorious at the time of death. I, <clears throat> I had a god brother, and he was from um, a certain you know, nationality, and I think he, he still identified with his previous religion. So the time of death, even though he passed away in a very holy or spiritual environment, because he, did, he still identified physically, materially, he wasn't able to get the full benefit of leaving his body in a spiritual place. Mm? And we don't want that to happen to us. What you give to others is going to also come after you. If you see other people as the body, do not be under the illusion that you're going to you know, easily develop a transcendental consciousness. Because how you see others is going to intimately relate to how you see yourself. So if you really accept you're not the body, but look after the body in the way that Krishna is pleased, and if you understand that other people are not the body either, while at the same time relating to them properly according to violation of etiquette, then progress will be explosive and very powerful. Hmm? So we'll stop there. Shri Upadesham Rita Ki Jai, Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai, Shri Rupa Goswami Ki Jai, Janita Gaur Pramanandi Hari <coughs> We have two, two minutes for questions, or should we? Because of okay, yes, at the back. Thank you for a really wonderful lecture. Um, I would like to ask one devotee who was uh, telling me how the, the devotees in this country they, going, they can uh, progress two ways. One is that they are going deep, and the other is that they are going high in the sense of uh, because we are as in this community. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we connect uh, spiritual advancement with positioning in this kind like you have some kind of higher position. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, uh, on the other hand, I remembered uh, uh, just recently I heard on a lecture that Shakti Tirta Maharaj, when he was uh, called Swami or Guru, uh, he would always, I mean, when he was called Swami, he would always say that he would correct people like that. He is not a swami, he is just a servant who is serving. Yeah, at the end when he was just before, okay. way before he left the body. Mm -hmm. So, how do we discriminate this? Is this material when we connect position yeah. in this call? Yeah, position isn't necessarily a sign of advancement. The Maharaj can correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, It's not necessarily a sign of advancement. Ad Yes, it's a way of service, yeah. yeah. It is in, it's, it's good in terms of devotees taking responsibility as Prabhupada says for spreading the movement. But the position, it's not that the person who's in the higher position institutionally is necessarily the most advanced person automatically. It doesn't follow like that. Is that a fair point? understanding and there may be some indication of that but that's not a principle to not judge by if you yes. judge by that principle you're going to make a mistake you know yeah. there was one person who was living in a seminary this was a christian seminary and he was the pot washer he was the most he was his only service was to wash pots but everyone would come to him for spiritual advice <laughs> Because he was understood to be the most advanced <laughs> yeah. in the whole seminar. <laughs> it's a, there's a book. It's a lot, I forgot the name of the book. I read it many, many years ago. So position has some element of indication, but if you see it in that way, and then you make a, a blanket judgment, then you can you'll probably commit offenses. Because you might, there might be devotees right next to you who are really on a high platform, although they might be just doing ordinary service. Yeah. Yeah. So a person is judged by advancement by how much they're engaged fully in devotional service. 
So you see, just like there's one devotee here, I won't mention his name, he's always serving. He's always serving. He stays in the background. He's completely absorbed in service 24 hours a day. And he's very humble. You know, and devotees know who I'm talking about, but, you know, he doesn't have any position. You know. So advancement really is the person who is who understands that Krishna consciousness is the goal of life and they absorb themselves in that service fully. Thank you very much. That's advancement. We take position in order to take on a particular type of responsibility in order to keep the function of the movement alive. So there has to be different kinds of services. There has to be, you know, sannyasis, there has to be gurus, there have to be pujaris, there has to be, you know, temple presidents, there has to be cooks, you know. So this is simply a, a way to keep the movement <coughs> functioning. The social services, yeah, yeah. So, but to judge like that completely would would mean to to see materially, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah, there's one devotee. He was he just recently left his body in in Miami. Do you remember that devotee? Just he's Prabhupada. Every day he was just out all by himself on books. Every day he did it for thirty, forty years. That's all. Go out in the morning, come back at night. And uh, that's, that was his whole service. And when he left his body, everybody glorified him because he just remained fixed in his service of book distribution. Never wanted any position, never wanted any recognition, never wanted anything other than just to do the service for Prabhupada. So, that's advancement. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's actually past uh, we've gone over time. And I know that there will be another seminar soon. So maybe if people have questions, they can mention them in the next. After, we'll have time for Q and A in the next session. If that's okay, because then that way we can actually. I think breakfast will be served soon, and so on. Okay. So thank you very much for your time. Please keep your questions, and we'll look at them next time. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Uta Bhavana Prabhu Ki.